Look, dude, all I'm saying is that if Mary Poppins was going to use her powers to turn back time on the clock and open up the window in the bank dude's office, why did we have to go through all that in the first place? You need to let this go. Hey, for First News, I'm Chris. And I'm Micah. Hey, coming up this week, this week is Decoration for Vacation Bible School. I was in a daze last week. So we are decorating the church to get ready for VBS. So if you can help out this week, week. let Ginger know um, and call up to the church office. They'll be decorating all week and need some help with that. This week. Also, if you haven't registered your kids or grandkids or some inviting people to come, make sure you go to our website, firstcorpus.org slash community, and you need to register because it's important. We will not have registration here on site. Everybody must be pre-registered for VBS, which is the last week of June. Or next week. So make sure that you get them pre-registered um, and all that good stuff. That's right. And hey, if you wouldn't mind being in prayer for myself and our teenagers, um, we've got four amazing sponsors who are going with us to camp. We're actually leaving tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, I can't wait. Youth camp's my favorite week of the year. Uh, we're up to 45 people going. Good. So, so excited. Hey, our students will be gone Monday through Friday at Highland Lake. So be praying for the Highland Lake staff, our the camp pastor, Worship band, Micah, the sponsors, and all the students uh, as they leave tomorrow at 10, and we'll be back here Friday, so we'll be praying for that. Also in July, July 14th, we have First Baptist Night at the Hooks. <coughs> uh, that's foul. And so we're selling tickets today, starting today, $10 a ticket. You can get them. We'll be sitting down the first baseline all together. And so come see me. We'll have tickets for sale for First Baptist Night at the Hooks on July the 14th. So, hey, hope you guys have a great week. Hey, we're so glad you're here to worship. Now we're going to throw it to this guy for welcome. Well, this guy, but he's now he's down there. So there have a great day. For First News, I'm Chris. And I'm Micah. And I'm Micah. Well, good morning. We're so thankful that you're here worshiping with us today. Um, as you've heard, we've got several exciting events coming up. We're, here we are. We're in summer, and it's just wonderful to think where we are this year as opposed to where we were at this time last year. Uh, our God is good, and I'm so excited that we get to be here together to worship Him. Uh, if you're watching us on the stream, or rather if you're listening to us on the stream, we'd like to apologize. Uh, we had some problems with the AEP yesterday, so we don't have a video right now, but you can hear the sweet sound of my voice. So. You're welcome. Uh, but everyone else here, we're so thankful that you're able to join us in person, whether, uh, and then everyone online, we're thankful for you as well. Um, let's pray, and then we're going to worship our risen King. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for what you've done. Lord, we ask a special blessing uh, over our teenagers and everyone going to youth camp tomorrow. Give us safe travels on the way there and on the way back, and help open up the hearts and the minds of the teenagers as we get ready to hear your word. Lord, I ask that you be with Ginger and the children's ministry team as they decorate for Vacation Bible School and for everything that's coming up with that, Lord. Uh, We love you and we thank you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Happy Father's Day. Let's worship.
come to worship a holy God this morning. Ask that you would stand with us this morning on this Father's Day as we sing God of our Fathers.
remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. No, -uh. my dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2, R2, R2. My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. We are thank so thankful for dads this morning, even though we make a little bit of light of it just along the way. Let's sing together once again, The Church is One Foundation. <laughs>
Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the cornerstone, that we can trust in you. We can build our very lives on you. Remind us today that when we attempt to build our, line, our lives on anything or anyone other than you, we are destined to fail. But when we place our trust in you, when we build our lives on you, we can serve you and live into the fulfilled life that you've, you've created us to live. And today as we specifically focus our attention on the importance of fatherhood and really on, on parenthood, I pray that you would remind us how important it is that we make sure as parents that our lives are built on you. There's really very little hope for our children in regards to the way that we raise them if, if we aren't modeling those things for them. So remind us of that today. We thank you that we can gather in a place together. We thank you that you are here in our midst. It's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. As you may be very well aware, and if you're not, let me just remind you that uh, we will ha have Vacation Bible School a week from tomorrow. And I bring that up for two reasons. One, please be in prayer for those who will be working with our children. Be in prayer for those children that will be here and take part in this wonderful outreach, this wonderful ministry, this opportunity for us to help them grow in their faith and in their understanding of what it means to follow Jesus. So first and foremost, I ask that you pray. Secondly, not to start with our morning together with uh, a, a guilt trip, but we still have seven slots that we need to fill with volunteers. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think it's wise to leave six to eight bed babies in a room with no adult supervision. <laughs> but right now, we have six or eight kids that will be in that bed baby room and not one adult signed up to work. And as I look around the room, people are stopping to, you're not making eye contact anymore. And <laughs> I'm just gonna leave that right there. Six kids, no adults, just pray about it. Uh, there are other spots as well. So please, uh, this table is just across from the elevator. If you can uh, give of your time, not this coming week, but the next in working with our children, we would certainly appreciate that. The second thing that I want to do, and just briefly, because we have been pretty silent uh, about this process, uh, partly because it is a very sensitive process in the sense that uh, we are looking for uh, someone to fill the role of our education and administration position uh, that our uh, beloved Steve vacated. Um, so we haven't talked about this much. I, I know it's something that is, is difficult for all of us to process. Um, and so I, I want to be very sensitive in that, but I also want to give you an update. There has been work going on. Uh, the personnel committee has been working towards finding someone to step into that role, uh, not to fill his spot because that's really impossible as you know, but to step into that role. And so just in a brief update, I will say, the committee was able to look through about seven potential candidates. From those seven, uh, really focus in on three that we did Zoom interviews with, the wonderful world of Zoom and uh, did that uh, several weeks ago. And then from that, we're able to, to narrow down to two that they really wanted to visit with in person. And so this past week, we brought one of those in for an interview, and this coming week, we'll bring in the second one uh, for an interview. So just wanted you to be aware of the process. Uh, both of these particular candidates, if God chooses to lead us in that direction, and lead them in this direction, uh, both of these candidates have children, school-aged children. And so time frame would be that the hope would be they could be here in time for the kids to start school. So again, I didn't want this to spring this on you in a few weeks, 
Uh, it's something that's been going on for the last couple of three months, but uh, just haven't talked a lot about it just because of the sensitive nature of, of the situation. And so be in prayer for the committee, be in prayer for these candidates, um, that God would truly make clear what he has for us uh, in this process. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Well, today we celebrate what? Fathers. Now, I will tell you, I had a pastor friend of mine who for many years he would say on Mother's Day, and you've probably heard me say this, on Mother's Day we talk about how wonderful our moms are, and on Father's Day we talk about what crummy fathers we have. (laughs) Today, gentlemen, that's not my focus. Because the role of the father in the home, in the family, is so important. It's vital. In fact, if you don't believe me, look at our world and notice what it looks like when the role of the father is not there. It is extremely important. And that's part of why we have defined as our vision for our church the vision of empowering families to make Christ the center of the home, daily drawing every individual to a closer walk with Jesus. That's our vision to really empower families, empower parents to raise their kids. We've talked about this, I don't wanna get too far off the subject, but we've talked about the importance of of why the, the church needs to come alongside parents to equip, to encourage. It's not the church's primary role to raise children to follow Jesus. That's the parent's role. And we're here to help and do our part, but we're also here to help parents and equip parents. And so that's part of why I wanted to really focus on what I wanna say to dads today, and really it's to parents in general, but we're focusing, because today is Father's Day, on, uh, on dads. Paul gives us some instruction. In Ephesians chapter five and six, we have what is called the household code, the family code. Here's how you should do it. And he starts with, uh, with husbands and wives in chapter five. Now I'm not gonna get too far down that road because there's many a pastor that have met their ill fate by going the wrong direction with that passage, if you know what I'm talking about. Wives, submit. Oh, I've already got a cold crowd already. <laughs> if you really look at that, in verse 21, by the way, on a side note, it says, each should submit to one another. And so wives are to submit to the husbands, and husbands are to love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So it's a mutual submission. So Paul gives us this beginning of this household code, this family code in in chapter 5, talks about this husband and wife relationship, and then moves in chapter 6 right into the rest of this code. He starts with kids, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Your translation may say provoke. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I want us to focus on this verse today. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Dads, do you love your kids? Most days. I can still remember the day, and y'all know I'm an emotional person, so I'm gonna try to hold it all together, but I can still remember the day. I have three boys, Christy and I have three boys. Most of you know that. I can still remember the day for each one of their births, holding that little bitty baby for the first time. And I remember thinking with each one, I would do anything for this child. By the way, I still feel that way. In that moment, there was nothing I wouldn't do for them. And what I learned in that is God grew my capacity to love. 
Most of you, if you've been through this, you understand, or maybe you've met that special one and, and married, and I realize we've got folks in, in all walks of life here in different ages and stages along this journey, but there's something miraculous that happens when God brings someone into our lives. Our capacity to love grows. I believe that is a gift of God. So I do think that that as fathers, we, we can't help but love our kids. And Paul gives us some guidelines on how we should show that love in the context of family. He says, don't exasperate your kids. That word really means to make angry or to make resentful, to provoke, to incite, to stir up. Don't do that with your kids. Could it be that the anger or the incitement or this frustration is felt when a person says one thing but does another? We'll come back to that in just a minute. Paul, Paul has just told kids to obey their parents and honor their father and mother. How frustrating it is for anyone to be commanded to do something that seems impossible or even worse, seems that it isn't right. I've had to visit with folks that, that wanna know, how is it that God can command me to honor my father and my mother and yet they act like this? I think that's what Paul's talking about. Don't frustrate your kids. And he doesn't mean don't tease them. I don't, can't remember too many times my dad teased me, but I can assure you I've teased mine. He's not saying don't joke around with them. He's not saying, uh, he says don't exasperate, don't frustrate them. And part of that is that we need to live the lives that would make it easy for them to honor and obey. Now, are we going to be perfect in that? No, we'll come back to that in just a moment as well. But that's what Paul is telling us, I think. We need to remember and realize that our kids are commanded to obey us and honor us. Now that doesn't give us license to do what we wanna do and expect them to obey us. It means that we need to understand and own the responsibility that our kids are supposed to obey us, supposed to honor us, and so therefore we ought to be motivated to live in such a way that that's possible for them. And not only possible, but something that they want to do. It's our job as parents, as fathers, to try and follow Paul's words. Our kids are commanded to obey us, to honor us, but we're commanded not to frustrate them, not, not to exasperate them, not to give them a reason to not want to honor and obey us. That's what it means really to love our kids, I think, partly truly love our kids in such a way that they know that they're loved, even without having to tell them. I'm not saying you shouldn't tell your kids you love them, but they need to know that even without words. And part of the way we do that is really working at how we live so that we don't exasperate them. I would say you should ask my children if I've ever exasperated them, but I will tell you right now I know that I have. But our goal should be to love them by living out a way, living our lives in such a way that they want to honor and obey. Being a good dad starts with loving well. Loving well. We say that we love our kids, but we need to truly love them well. And then Paul says, we shouldn't exasperate them, but instead, we should bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Bring them up. A side note here. I understand. And I think I'm getting to the point now that my kids are a little older, my sons are... are in fact, our oldest will be 29 this year. Holy cow. And there is a friendship 
There is a friendship. But let me just say that the role of the parent is not first and foremost to be a friend, to be a best friend, a buddy. Now, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't be friends. We sh absolutely should. We should be confidants for our confidants for our kids. We should support and encourage our kids, but we must always remember that we are a parent. And we are to bring up our kids in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Sometimes that's not popular. But we are to have guidelines and parameters. I think Paul really speaks to this in the word that he chooses here, and it doesn't communicate well in English, but I want us to look at this. He says to bring up. The word there really means to raise, but another translation is to feed, to feed. Think about that for a minute. As a parent, would you willingly feed anything to your child that you know would hurt them? The correct answer is no. We also need to remember that sometimes, especially when they're young, kids want things that they don't necessarily need. By the way, as adults, we do too. <laughs> kids sometimes want to eat things that they shouldn't eat. It's not healthy. I remember as a child, I would beg to just take the whole tub of Cool Whip and a spoon and go and sit in front of the television. But my mother would not let me do that. <laughs> Probably not healthy. As parents, we are to feed our children what we know they need. We are to raise them up with what we know will help them to succeed in life that will help them to live that fulfilled life, not to feed them things that are just going to make it worse. Paul says, don't exasperate your kids, but rather instead feed them the training and instruction of Jesus. Train them to understand who he is. Train them to understand his teachings. We just finished a series a few weeks ago on the Shema. But let me just remind you what that says. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. All the way back to the Mosaic Law, we are told that we are to train our kids with these commands. And Paul is just echoing that. Instead of exasperating them, instead of living a life inconsistent, instead of frustrating them, train them instruct them in how that they should live. We are to bring them up, to feed them, and train them in the instruction of the Lord. The greatest thing we can do for our kids, the best way to love them well, is to teach them about Jesus. To teach them what Jesus taught. To help them see the importance of living their lives for Jesus. Now, as I said, a lot of times, and you've heard me say this before, but a lot of times parents, good, good intention, well-intentioned parents who know that it's their responsibility to raise their children to follow Jesus, hand their kids over to the church and say, here, do something with my children. That is part of our role as the church, we are to be here to, to grow disciples, to make disciples, and that's from bed babies on up through senior adults. But it is not the primary role of raising children, or the primary role of raising children to follow Jesus does not fall to the church. It falls to the parents. So Paul reminds us 
Don't exasperate your kids, but instead raise them up, bring them up, feed them in the training and instruction of the Lord, of Jesus. How are we doing that? How are you as a dad today doing that, as a parent today doing that? Being a good dad involves raising your kids to follow Jesus. That's part of the responsibility. As I said a moment ago, one of the foundational ways we raise our kids in Jesus' training and instruction is to live it out before their eyes, to be an example. And I believe one of the most exasperating things, one of the most frustrating things for a child is to be commanded to obey their parents, but their parents don't act in a way that they would see the need to obey or to honor. Paul tells kids to obey and honor. Our role is to make that possible and not exasperate them in their attempts. And the best way we do that is by living out a good example, being a role model in what it looks like to follow Jesus. I've had meetings several times with parents after their children have made a profession of faith, a decision to follow Jesus, to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. And I've had meetings with parents to say, you've got to live this out at home because it doesn't matter what we teach them here. If they're not seeing at home, they're not going to, it's not going to matter. If you're relying on the church to train your kids to follow Jesus and they see you as a parent not living what they're being taught, what do you think they're going to do with that? How do you think they're going to respond? Who are they going to listen to? Here's a hint. It's not the church. They need to see us living this out, truly being a Jesus follower that they would want to emulate, to honor, to obey. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you, and then I said I'd probably share more on this day. Recently, I've had a time to spend um, a lot of time with my dad, uh, my mom and dad. Um, my dad is one of those role models that uh, you've heard me say before, someday I hope to grow up and be like him, and my mom as well. But one of the things that, that I would share about my dad is that he really is that role model, that godly figure in my life. And I know not everyone has that story, but for me, it's important. Um, He's hardworking. He has a, a big heart and he will do just about anything for anyone. Whatever he may be doing at the time always gets set aside if he can, can help someone else. Most importantly, he loves Jesus. And when I think about him and the way that he stands out in my mind, in the way that he loves Jesus, in the way that he loves others, is his pure heart. He's the real deal. And that's why I say someday I hope to grow up and be like him. Because he truly is a role model. And I think that's important. I was reminded as I thought about our time together and I thought about my own dad and I thought about the impact that he has had in my life in a positive way. I thought about that, that pure heart. I thought about really one of my favorite verses uh, is, comes out of Psalm 51, create in me a pure heart. Psalm 30, 73 verse one says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Christy and I have been watching The Chosen. Uh, I would encourage you to do that. It's, it's pretty insightful. One of the things that, that struck me about watching this series is their depiction of how Jesus called his disciples. And in John chapter one, we find this record that, that Jesus was beginning to, to call his disciples. And so we find in verse 44 of chapter one, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, 
We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see. Come and see, said Philip. This is the part I want you to hear. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Think about the fact that the psalmist chose to relay to us the importance of a pure heart, a contrite spirit, that Jesus, when he saw Nathanael, said, Here's a man whose heart is pure, in whom there is no guile, in whom there is no deceit. Dads, parents, that's who we need to be. We need to be those people that are pure in heart, those who are transparent, those who are real, those who strive to live their lives to honor Jesus and do so in a very real way. One of the things that can exasperate children, can exasperate anyone, is for a person to act one way in this room and totally different at home. We need to be pure in heart, no deceit, to truly be real Jesus followers. Dads, that's the greatest gift you can give your child. Because then when you seek and you try to do what it says here, to bring up your children, to, to feed your children in the training and instruction of the Lord, they will be prone to respond. They will be prone to obey because they see that it's real for you. It's not just something that you say. The old adage, do what I say, not what I do, that never, ever works. Never has, never will. You have influence more than you really know. Your kids are watching you. They're commanded to obey you. So are you living a life that makes their obedience easier or are you exasperating them? Being a good dad means being consistent in your walk with Jesus. So my challenge for us this morning, as a dad, really as a parent, commit yourself to loving your children well by raising them to follow Jesus. That's the greatest gift you can give them. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word that reminds us our responsibility, our role, and whether we're children or parents, and most of us are both, many of us are both. Remind us that as children, we are to obey and honor our father and mother. And remind us as parents, particularly today as dads, that we are to live a life that trains them, instructs our children to follow you, to live a life that is not frustrating for them to watch, but rather a life that leads them to want to obey, to want to honor. Give us the courage to do that. Father, the fact that these men are here today tells me and tells us that, that they love you. And from that, I would like to believe that they love their children, and I, and I do believe that. So today, remind us, remind me, that it is so important for us, out of the love that we have for our kids, to live a life that truly guides them, that models for them what it means to love you and to follow you. Give us strength to do that today. Give us a desire to do that every day. And find us faithful in that. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.
In just a moment, we'll have our time of response. We have begun to have people come forward if you feel comfortable doing that. If you would like someone to pray with you, I will be here. Chris will be here, I believe. I don't see him right now. Um, if there's a decision that you would like to make, uh, today would be a great day to do that. Uh, whatever God puts on your heart, respond to him. And as you sing together, as we sing together, think about how God can use you to truly raise up, bring up your kids to follow him. As we stand and sing together. Just as I Happy Father's Day. It is good to be together. And let me just let you know about something. We actually, I, I made sure that we did our homework. But tomorrow is the birthday of the oldest living member of our church. Virginia Lee Vaughn will turn 100 years old or young tomorrow. Joe Brown is close behind. Uh, but Virginia Lee will turn 100 tomorrow. And so you're going to find in your Bible study boxes when you get to your Bible study in just a moment that a drive-by birthday honk or wave or whatever uh, is organized for immediately following Bible study today for those who would like to participate in that. Uh, you'll gather on the parking lot and just drive down Ocean. She lives on Ocean Drive uh, a little bit down the way. And so there's information about that in your boxes when you get to your room. So just wanted you to be aware of that, uh, that uh, she is celebrating 100 years tomorrow. So we can help do that if you're interested in doing that. As we are dismissed this morning, may the God who created us out of love, who loves us unconditionally, remind us that we are to love particularly our children. 
well. Amen. We're dismissed.